A woman was driving down the street when suddenly the police pulled her over. Not just one cop car, but four. The police surrounded her and appeared ready to draw their weapons. Well, the woman got out of her vehicle, shaking and scared to death. What in the world is going on? She asked. The police said they saw her weave in and out of traffic, break the speed limit, and even roll through a few stop signs. Okay, she said, but all this for some traffic violations? Not quite. A bumper sticker on the back of her car said, Honk if you love Jesus. However, the police thought whoever was driving the car couldn't be a Christian. So they figured the car must have been stolen. Well, that story makes a good point, doesn't it? God calls Christians to a higher standard than those who don't profess any faith. Wouldn't you agree? The name Christian means Christ-like, and people expect a person who takes that name to be, well, like Christ. Yet that's not always the case. And that is the scandal of Christianity. Polls actually show that much of the moral behavior of professed Christians is the same as, if not worse than, that of those who profess no faith at all. Though the reasons for this are complicated, I've been stressing that one key factor has to do with the erroneous idea that God's grace has somehow negated God's law, or that the law was done away with at the cross. Let's be reasonable. If you keep telling Christians that God has abolished the law, then sooner or later they're going to stop keeping it, right? I mean, if some trustworthy authority tells me that all federal tax laws have been abolished, then sooner or later, and probably sooner than later, I'm going to stop paying federal taxes. Now, people react the same way regarding God's law. If ministers keep telling their members that the gospel of Christ has abolished the moral law, then why should anyone be surprised that so many Christians are violating that law? What makes all this even worse is that because the Bible defines sin as transgression of the law, see 1 John 3 verse 4, then the idea that the law is abolished means that all sin has been abolished too. Centuries ago, British satirist Jonathan Swift wrote, but will any man say that if the words drinking, cheating, lying, stealing were by act of parliament ejected out of the English tongue and dictionaries, we should all awake next morning temperate, honest, just, and lovers of truth? Is this a fair consequence? <laughs> and right here is the point. Similarly, if God's law has been abolished, why are there still adulterers, murderers, and liars in abundance? And if the law has been abolished, why are adultery, lying, and murder still sinful? See, the truth is that the New Testament proclaims both the law and the gospel. They go together. The law shows us what sin is, and the gospel points us to the remedy for sin, the death and resurrection of Jesus in our behalf. German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer was right when he wrote, there can be no preaching of the law without the gospel, and no preaching of the gospel without the law. Whatever the church's word of the world may be, it must always be both law and gospel. 
Now, I know the moment that we mention the law, some people instantly think of legalism. I can hear them saying, oh, Lonnie, please, don't get us trapped in the pit of legalism by dragging the law into the hope of the gospel. Don't say that to me. Say that to Jesus, who told the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, verse 17, if you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Or say that to Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, 19, who wrote, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Say that to John in 1 John 2, 3, who said, we know that if we have come to know him, if we obey his commands, I know that legalism is real. I know that many people have struggled with the legalism beast and that it has eaten some of them alive. But to equate obedience to God's law with legalism is like equating the right to bear arms with the right to murder. One is a gross perversion of the other. Let me give you an example. Our treasurer here at my Surprise Arizona Church is, as I know, a very, very honest woman. But suppose, let's suppose one day she asked me to help her steal some money from the church books. And suppose I said, what? I can't do that. It's a sin, a violation of God's law. To which she replies, oh, Lonnie, you're such a legalist. Don't you know that we're under grace now, not under the law? <laughs> kind of ridiculous if you really think about it, right? When the Old Testament patriarch, Joseph, was a young, handsome slave in Egypt, the Bible says his master's wife tried to seduce him. Genesis 39 verse 9 says that at that point, Joseph cried out, how can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Sin against God? What's wrong with you, Joseph? Are you a legalist or something? <laughs> Let's not confuse the matter. Obedience to God is not legalism. On the contrary, obedience to God is the fruit of the gospel. Obedience is the reality of the gospel in our lives. Obedience is the day-by-day -day practical manifestation of the reality of Christ working to renew us into his image. There's no such thing as being a Christian if there's no obedience to God, no obedience to his law. Someone may be thinking, these are strong words, Lonnie. I agree. But they're not as strong as some of Jesus' words on this very topic. In the context of the last days of judgment, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 23, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Depart from me, you who practice what? Lawlessness. That's right. The Greek word original to the Gospel of Matthew is anomion. And it means just that, lawlessness. So Jesus is chastising those who were professing to follow him, yet not obeying the law. Well, is Jesus being legalistic? Of course not. In fact, I would suggest that the people he's chastising are the legalists. How's that? Because look at what they're saying. Lord, have we not done this? Lord, Lord, have we not done that? Have we, 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 done, 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 done?
done all these things for you. Well, that, my friend, is legalism. They were pointing to themselves, to their own deeds, their own works, as the reason why God should accept them. They were looking to be justified by what they had done, not by the works that Jesus had done for them. That is legalism, pure and simple. The idea that somehow our works, our good deeds, can commend us to God when in reality our only hope of salvation is the good works that Jesus did in our behalf. Take a closer look at Luke chapter 10, verses 18 to 14. Here's Jesus again. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at the distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Who was the legalist? It was the one who pointed to himself, to his own actions, to his own works, to his own law keeping. He was saying, Look at all that I've done. That's the legalist. In contrast, the publican didn't even want to lift up his eyes toward God. He was leaning totally on divine grace, totally on the merits of his Savior. That's precisely why Jesus said that he, the publican, and not the Pharisee, was the one who went home justified. Though the parable doesn't say, I'd be willing to bet the farm that if we were to look at their lives closely, the publican's life was more in harmony with the law of God than was the Pharisee's life. Listen, we certainly don't want to fall into the mouth of the legalism beast. But we don't want to fall into the grip of the lawlessness beast either. The idea that because we're Christians, under grace, we're no longer needing to obey God's law. Instead, we all need to cling moment by moment, day by day, to the righteousness of Jesus and to claim that righteousness as our only hope of salvation. And then, in love and gratitude to the God who has done so much for us, we need to seek to obey him and his commands in the strength he supplies. As long as we do this, always aware of our need of Christ's righteousness for salvation, the legalism beast will never devour us, and neither will the lawlessness one.